eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, I can only imagine. I feel honored to be here on such a high day in the presence of such greatness today. I want to thank Pastor Jack. I want to thank the pastoral staff for their privilege to even stand behind this desk. Every time I come up here, it uh, doesn't get any easier. You feel more the weight of the message and the deep responsibility. But there is somebody greater. And so we give it all the glory and we ask God to do what we cannot do. I've taken a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 to 18 for this message today. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 to 18. And in the New International Version, it reads as follows. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Spirit, now the Lord is spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And just that last verse again. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I've entitled this message today simply His Image. Let's pray. Father God, once again You've allowed us to see another Sabbath day. Lord, we pray that you may do what you have done week after week, Lord. Take these next few moments, take these next few words, and translate them into the language of heaven and feed your people. They need a word from you. Speak now, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. The evening meal was over. Mom was in the kitchen washing dishes. Dad was in the office looking over bills. The children were in the living room watching television. It was your typical evening in the household of a young Asian family. A loud, piercing scream from the living room changed everything. Mom and dad frantically ran into the living room. What they saw would forever be burned upon their minds. Their 10-year-old was crying and screaming. Their six-year-old daughter was on the floor, arms and legs jerking uncontrollably. Her eyes rolled back in her head. The parents had never seen anything like this before. They had no medical not background, but they're based on their limited knowledge, they felt their daughter was having a seizure. The frightened parents grabbed their daughter and made a mad dash to the hospital, which fortunately was just a few minutes away. By the time they arrived at the hospital, it would appear to most onlookers that they were merely holding a sleeping child. The uncontrollable jerking had stopped, and the child was now resting quietly. A nurse came over, did a quick assessment, and assured the parents your daughter is going to be just fine. The parents were then left to fill out the necessary paperwork. Moments later, another family burst into the emergency room holding a child who had had a seizure for the first time. Now, it's not unusual in a big hospital with a busy emergency room for two cases of the same thing to come into the same emergency room at the same time. But then, a third family came in with a child who'd had a seizure for the very first time. Before the evening was out, a fourth, 
a fifth and a sixth family came into that same emergency room with children who had had a seizure for the very first time. It was apparent to all this was no coincidence. The stories were similar. The children were watching television when the seizure started. The children, in fact, were all watching the same TV show. A new, never before episode, aired episode of an animated television show called Pokemon. The, 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 the particular part in the show had rapid changing scenes, flashing lights and flashing colors, and that's what triggered a seizure in these children. It's a condition called photosensitive epilepsy. You can have photosensitive epilepsy and never know it until something triggers an episode. That something could be the lights of a movie, a television program, or even a video game. That episode of Pokemon, which aired in Japan in 1997, has been banned from being shown on television again. What we view, the images that come before our eyes, the things we allow our eyes to linger upon, affect us consciously and unconsciously. By beholding, we are changed. Every day we are bombarded with hundreds of thousands of images, emails, text messages, social media, newspapers, billboards, images. They all come with messages. Everybody is trying to tell us something. There are cameras everywhere. When you leave your house, you're likely to be captured on your neighbor's security camera. When you go to the grocery store, the bank, the airport, the gas station, school, or work, there is a camera somewhere that's monitoring your activity. With cameras being almost everywhere, we are seeing the world in a way we've never seen it before. We are seeing images in real time. When we hear about a tragedy, it touches us. When we read about a disaster, it moves us. But visual imagery is a higher, more powerful form of communication. It influences us in ways unlike any other com communication. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. We now see images in real time. We see hurricanes as they are happening. We see tornadoes as they are happening. We see earthquakes as they are happening. We see accidents and even murders as they are happening. Many seem to have become immune to the millions of horrific images that are readily available, but by beholding, we are changed. Every once in a while, millions of people see something that shakes them to the core. Every once in a while, America sees an image that they just can't ignore. Every once in a while, an image moves many people to action. America knows about its injustice. America knows about its racism. Every day you hear about racism. Every day you read about injustice. But on May 25, 2020, an image appeared of a policeman kneeling on the neck of a helpless man. The police said he had a medical incident and later died. The police report read that proper procedure and protocol was followed, but despite what the police said and despite what the police report read, the images told a different story. The images didn't agree with what was said. The images didn't agree with what was read. The images showed a black man being murdered on the street by a policeman. And because of those images, that policeman now sits in jail. The images caused millions of people around the world to go out and start protesting in the middle of a pandemic. Because of those images, statues of Confederate leaders were torn down. Because of those images, street names that were named for Confederate soldiers were renamed. Because of those images, young people of all race who had never been to a protest, who had never even thought of going to a protest, stood on corners of streets in their middle class neighborhood, holding up signs saying Black Lives Matter, not because of what they read, not because of what was said, but because of the images that they saw. By beholding, we are changed. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The complexity of the human body cannot be ignored, cannot be denied. The best argument we have for intelligent design, the best argument we have for intelligent design is ourselves. 
you know, I marvel sometimes. There are scientists who don't believe in God. There are scientists who do not believe that there is a creator. I'm amazed because sometimes they're very inconsistent. For example, an archaeologist on a remote excavation in the middle of nowhere stumbles upon seven or eight identical rocks all placed in a pattern. They get all excited and they say, this is evidence of intelligent design. There is no way seven or eight identical rocks could have come together and formed this pattern. We don't know who put this there. We don't know when they put it there, but this was not done by accident. Well, Mr. Scientist, if you're all excited about a bunch of rocks that have come together to make a pattern, here is something far more exciting. Here is something far more amazing. A group of cells, each a factory in and of itself, coming together to form a living tissue. And living tissues coming together to form a functioning organ. And functioning organs coming together to form a living, working organ system. And an organ system coming together to form a walking, talking, thinking, thinking, moving, identical human being. That's God. That is not an accident. That is God. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created. God created. However you look at it, there is no question. We were made with planning. We were made with precision. We were made with purpose. We were made in the image of God. Now, scholars have debated for centuries, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? Now, I have to give it to you. There are many similarities between us and the animals. In fact, some will say anatomically and physiologically speaking, there are more similarities between us and the animals than there are differences. However, there is one key difference between us and the animals, and it's our brain. More specifically, the front of our brain, the frontal lobe, that portion that is behind, that is in our forehead, that part is more developed and more complex than any other creature on Earth. The frontal lobes of our brain are responsible for speech, language, attention, concentration, memory, planning, problem solving, regulation of emotions, impulse control, controlling our social behaviors, and the list goes on and on. We know God because of our frontal lobes. We praise and worship God because of our frontal lobes. The Bible says we were made in the image of God, and I believe, I believe that is specifically referring to the frontal lobes of our brain. I also believe that when Jesus returns, he is specifically coming back for a people who reflect his character or his image in their frontal lobes. That's what I believe. But let's look at a text. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. It's the last book in the Bible. It's the last chapter in the Bible, and it's verse 4. And it reads in the King James Version as follows. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. They're not talking about Jesus being written on your forehead. They're not talking about Jesus being tattooed on your forehead. They're talking about something deeper than this. They are talking about his character being in your forehead, in your forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain, your frontal lobe. You, the character of God is in your forehead. It's in your brain. The people who reflect God's character or God's image will see Jesus. Ellen White, in that famous quote, she says, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come. How do you reproduce the character of God? How do you reflect his image? Well, 2 Corinthians 3.18, our opening text, 
really tells you right there, especially in that verse 18, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. Unveiled faces. We come to God with a teachable spirit. No hidden agenda, no presuppositions, no foredrawn conclusions. Contemplate, contemplate, ponder, think, meditate, read his word, think on his word, contemplate and meditate on his word, and we are transformed into his image by the work of the Holy Spirit. Fortify your mind with the word of God. Fortify your mind with the word of God. He will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Read his word. Study his word. Repeat his word. Memorize his word. Meditate on his word. Keep your mind stayed on him. If you keep your mind stayed on him, then you will have this mind that is also in Christ Jesus. Don't waste your time giving people who've lost their mind a piece of your mind. If you keep giving people who've lost their mind a piece of your mind, you'll end up losing your mind. Don't pay them any mind. Make up your mind to keep your mind stayed on Jesus. I hope somebody got that. So God created man in his image. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. But by 2 Corinthians 3, 18, he's talking about being transformed back into the image of God. What happened between Genesis and Corinthians? Well, we know what happened. Sin came along. Sin came along and degraded, distorted, and deformed the image of God into what we have today. The image is so distorted that many of us feel closer connection to the animals than we do to the God who created us. Many of us are more accepting of the supposition that we evolved from animals than the reality that we devolved from a creative, perfect God. The truth is man is not on an upward climb, but he is on a downward spiral. The people who lived when the world was first created were of high intellect and knowledge. Ellen White says that the antediluvian world did not need books. They were able to retain vast amounts of knowledge. You know, today we have people who say we have photographic memories because they can recall everything in great detail. But back then, Everybody had a photographic memory. Imagine listening to a sermon for a whole hour and then being able to repeat every single word verbatim, word from word. That's how we were created. We didn't have to write anything down. We remembered what was said. We didn't have to take a picture. We remembered what we saw. But sin has caused degradation, and now it has severely limited our abilities. Knowledge has increased. Technology is more advanced, but we are not much smarter. Much of our technology is our attempt to make up for the deficiencies that sin has caused. The biggest battle we have to fight is the battle for our souls. The battle for our souls is really a battle for our brains. The battle for our brains is really a battle for our frontal lobes. Every day is a battle to maintain and attain the image of God. There are so many images and chemicals and distractions out there that negatively influence much more than ever before. Growing up, I had, we had one television with six channels. Now we have cable TV with 500 channels, not to mention Netflix and Disney and Hulu and Peacock and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, and the list goes on and on. The average adult, they says, spakes half of their waking hours staring at a screen. They say today, the average adult will spend 34 years of their life looking at some type of screen, being it a television screen or a computer screen or that of a phone. It is believed that more than half of this time is spent unproductively. That's 17 years. I don't know about you, I don't have 17 years to waste. And what are you doing? Watching endless entertainment over and over again, binge watching, binge watching, watching everything on and on it goes, endless entertainment. But not everyone is wasting time. While you're there watching your 10th or 12th hours of, of Netflix, there's somebody over there finishing a degree. While you're watching endless hours of Hulu, there's somebody over there starting a new career or, or writing books. Now, some may say, 
I don't want to write books. I don't want to finish a degree. I just want to be entertained. But folks, while you're over there watching your endless entertainment, there's another group of people that are meeting, but they're meeting behind closed doors. And they are creating policies, they are making laws that directly affect you, but they're making them without your input, without your knowledge, without your consent, without your approval. They are making gun laws to make it easy to get guns. They are making up new voting laws. They are redrawing congressional districts. They are purging voting names off the list. They are saying, oh, keep busy, keep watching your, ent uh, your entertainment, be happy with that. In in fact, here's Juneteenth. There's a holiday for you. Are you happy now? But they took your name off the voter list in the meantime, without your consent, without your approval, without your knowledge. <laughs> Family, we need to stay awake. We need to stay awake. We can't be watching endless amounts of entertainment while the world is making decisions that affect you. We are not only wasting our time, but we're looking at the wrong images. We are getting the wrong information. We not only have misinformation, but we have disinformation, intentional false information designed purposely to lead us in a wrong way, driving us to make wrong conclusions and to follow harmful in, uh, information. Conspiracy theories. The pandemic is a hoax. The vaccine is the mark of the beast. People aren't really dying from COVID. Misinformation, disinformation, conspiracy theories are ending friendships. They're driving people out of the church. Conspiracy th theories have led to violent interactions. The internet and the social media are fueling this. You know, there was a time when the news was just report the news. Now they're doing more than just report the news. They're influencing news. They're manipulating the news. They are creating the news. I'm not your enemy. You're not my enemy. COVID is the enemy, sin is the enemy, the devil is the enemy, but don't let the news manipulate you and tell you, influence you, and change you, because by beholding, we are changed. Now, there are many other things that distort the images of God. There are many drugs and substances and chemicals out there that directly affect the frontal lobes. I have to mention the most popular one, Alcohol, anybody who's telling you alcohol is good for the heart, that's nonsense. Alcohol is a poison, it's a cancer-causing poison, and it directly affects your frontal lobes. It compromises your judgment. Why is it that every day thousands of people drink alcohol and get behind their wheel and drive away? Because their judgment is compromised. Their judgment is compromised. You cannot afford to have your judgment compromised when you have the devil walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, there's a story I've heard over and over again during my career. I've heard it from men. I've heard it from women. I've heard it from young people and I've heard it from some older people. And the story goes like this. I went to a party. I had one drink. The next thing I clearly remember is waking up in a room I've never been in before, on a bed I've never slept on before, next to a person I've never seen before, Shock, terror, confusion, embarrassment overwhelms them. They grab their clothing, grab their clothing. And now they run out of there in such a panic, and they're now here to see me because they need to know if they've contracted some type of disease from this encounter. There are very dangerous drugs out there, drugs that are very dangerous, drugs like ketamine, rohypnol, and GHB. You may never have heard of these names before, but you may have heard of the other name they go by, date rape drugs. Ketamine and GHB are colorless, odorless, and tasteless, and can easily be slipped into a drink. Once ingested, they cause anterograde amnesia, anterograde amnesia, meaning that once they ingested, you don't remember much of anything that happens to you for the next four to six hours afterwards. They say, I shouldn't have had that drink, but I would venture to say 
you shouldn't have been at that party. Because as there are some places, as soon as you walk into them, the sights, the sounds, the lights, the music, the smell of the chemicals in the air already start to compromise your judgment. You will lose every time. You will lose every time if you put yourself on the devil's ground. You will lose every time if you put yourself on the devil's ground if you don't have Jesus with you. You know, it's no coincidence, it's no accident that our sharpest minds, our brightest minds are under constant attack from distractions, from endless wasted hours of video games and social media. And what is it doing to our young people? What is it doing to our young people? The experts say it is creating unrealistic expectations, negative body images, insecurities, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts. Many of our young people don't even realize who they are or the abilities that God has put inside of them. You know, as I've gotten older, I, I, I've recognized something. Every once in a while, God will allow an older person to get a glimpse of the potential that is in a young person. And once we see that potential, we get all excited. But then when we get frustrated, when we see that young person not reaching their God-given potential, they're settling. They're settling for mediocrity. They're settling for, for a call, for a, 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 a high school diploma when God has put inside of them the ability for a PhD. They settle for reading a book when they should be writing their own book. They settle for working at the company when they should be running the company. They settle for being a renter when they should be the owner. They settle for borrowing when they should be a lender. It's not easy reaching your God-given potential. It's not easy easy. It's going to require hard work. I can guarantee these judges can testify of that. It's going to take hard work. It's not going to be easy. You're going to need self-discipline. You're going to need dedication. You're going to need determination. You're going to need perseverance. But if God before you, who can stand against you? Now there's another sad irony that happens as we get older we start forgetting. That short-term memory, just not as good. That quick, instant recall is just not as sharp as it was. It gets frustrating. But the good news is, it's just temporary. It's just temporary until Jesus comes. So do everything you can to keep your mind sharp. Eat your blueberries and your blackberries and your strawberries. Eat your almonds and your walnuts. Eat your kale, broccoli, and spinach. Challenge your mind. Commit Bible text to memory. Learn a new instrument. Learn a new language. Challenge your mind every day. Then use whatever tools you need to help you remember. If you don't remember the name of the head elder, call a friend. If you don't remember the names of your grandchildren, ask your children. If you don't remember the names of everything you're supposed to get at the grocery store, write a list. If you don't remember the names of the last four presidents of the United States, hey Siri, what's the name of the last four Siri of the United States? If you don't remember the capital of Jamaica, Google it. If you don't remember the names of the books of the Old Testament, ask Alexa. If you don't remember my name, don't worry about it. It's not important. It doesn't matter. It's not a big deal because when it's all said and done, when you don't know where else to go, when you don't know where to turn, when you know don't have any action, there's only one name that matters. There's only one name that'll help you. There's only one name that will heal you. There's only one name that has power. There's only one name that will save you. There's only one name they will have peace. There's a name above all other names. It's a beautiful name. It's the sweetest name I know. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is healing in the name of Jesus. There is hope in the name of Jesus. There is salvation in the name of Jesus. If you forget every other name, if you forget every other name, always remember Jesus. All right, I'm winding down here. When Jesus finally returns, when Jesus finally returns, there will be no final exam. There will be no final quiz. You won't have to explain the 2300-day prophecy. You won't have to repeat the Lord's Prayer or the 23rd Psalm. Because when Jesus returns, it's not about what you know. 
But watch this. When Jesus returns, it's not even about who you know. The only question to be answered when Jesus returns is, does he know you? Because in Matthew 7, verse 23, it makes it plain that there's only two sets of people when he comes back. I know you or I didn't know you. So it doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter if you're in intensive care, on a ventilator, can't move, can't breathe, don't know where you are. The only question when Jesus returns is, does he know you? It doesn't matter if you've got Alzheimer's dementia, if you don't remember your spouse, if you don't remember the names of your kids, need help eating, he helped getting dressed. The only question when Jesus returns is, does he know you? It doesn't matter if if you're dead, buried, in a grave, unmarked, in the middle of nowhere, the only thing that happens when Jesus returns is, does he know you? And if he knows you, he's got something for you. He's got something for you. He's got a couple of keys for you. He's got a couple of keys for you. You've never seen keys like this. One key is called death. The other key is called hell. And you are not bound by either one of them because Jesus has the keys. All your life, all your life, the devil has been waving death and hell in your face. All your life, the devil has been threatening you with death in hell. You're going to die. You're going to hell. You're going to die. You're going to hell. No, you're not. That's for the devil and his angels. I know who has the keys. Jesus has the keys. Hallelujah. So the only question is, the only question is, does he know you? Does he know you? Do you speak to him every day? Do you speak to him every day? Yes? He knows you. Do you ask him to guide your life every day? Every day, do you ask for his Holy Spirit to lead you? Yes? He knows you. When you mess up, when you say something you shouldn't have said, when you do something you shouldn't have done, do you repent? Do you ask for forgiveness? Yes? He knows you. Have you helped a few folks out along the way? Have you visited a few sick people? Have you encouraged somebody who's lost all hope? Because inasmuch as you have done it to the least of these, You've done it to him. Did you? He knows you. He knows your name. He knows your heart. He knows the very number of hairs on your head. He knows you. But when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees his image.